Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our briefing, Momentum on Climate Adaptation. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Our session today is the second briefing in a five-part series, What Congress Needs to Know in the Lead Up to COP26. For the entire month of October, which I like to call to the chagrin of certain of my colleagues, COPtober, we are focused on providing briefings and related educational resources with the information and insights policymakers and their staff need in the lead up to, during, and after the 26th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. I would like to acknowledge our honorary co-sponsor, the British Embassy Washington, and our great partner, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, for their support and cooperation that make this briefing series possible. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. The ESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage, climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts, are always available for free online at www.esi.org. And the best way to stay informed about our latest educational resources is to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. And as part, as, our, and as part of our focus on COP26, we will publish a special daily newsletter during the Climate Talks, Glasgow Dispatch, to help keep Congress updated on the developments of these critical negotiations. You can subscribe online at www.esi.org forward slash COP news. This is the second EESI briefing of 2021 that puts the spotlight on climate adaptation and resilience in the broader context of COP26. Back on April 19th, our first look happened just as we began to commemorate the 51st Earth Day and while we awaited the new greenhouse gas emissions reduction goal, the U.S. nationally determined contribution set to be unveiled by the Biden-Harris administration at the Leaders' Summit on Climate. And now we return to the topic almost exactly six months later, in a few weeks before leaders, diplomat scientists, and other stakeholders descend on Glasgow to advance the negotiations started by the historic Paris Agreement. The focus of today's briefing are adaptation initiatives that have been launched or scaled up since the last meeting of the Conference of Parties in 2019. These initiatives span the multiple dimensions of adaptation work, demonstrating the many ways that we need to think about and take actions to adapt to the changing climate. Climate adaptation and resilience is a major area of emphasis in our work to provide educational resources to policymakers. We know, as discussed in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report, that even if we were to muster the transformational policies and investments that put us on a path to limit global warming by 1.5 degrees Celsius tomorrow, we would still be dealing with climate change for years and decades because of the greenhouse gas emissions already in the atmosphere. So we will need to advance a comprehensive set of climate adaptation and resilience solutions to withstand these effects, especially where those impact, impacts affect disproportionately vulnerable frontline and environmental justice communities. In addition to the April 19th briefing, we previously organized a 16-part congressional briefing series about coastal resilience issues that featured success stories and innovative approaches from U.S. coastal communities from Maine to Hawaii, from Alaska to Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. From those briefings, we organized the various findings presented by more than 40 panelists into a major report released just about one year ago that featured 30 specific policy recommendations for Congress to consider. This report, A Resilient Future for, Resi a Resilient Future for Coastal Communities, is built around six guiding principles that generally inform our report approach to climate adaptation and resilience. The sixth principle, climate adaptation and resilience work should complement and contribute to a decarbonized clean energy economy is what continues to motivate us. And as with everything else we do, you can access our report by visiting us online at www.esi.org. The initiatives we are able to cover today are complemented by additional efforts like national adaptation planning, country dialogues under the Adaptation Action Coalition, and the Adaptation Research Alliance. In fact, ESI just published an article on the Adaptation Research Alliance, and for the first time, we included adaptation and resilience jobs in our latest update to our climate jobs fact sheet. 
Both of those new resources were featured in our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, and can also be found online. So here we are today, just a few weeks before COP26 gets underway in Glasgow. While the State Department leads the official new US negotiations under the UNFCCC, con congressional attention paid to COP26 is critical because reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and scaled up adaptation work will require new policies and investments that only Congress can provide. Our briefing series, which began last Friday, is designed to help Congress understand the intersection of US climate policy and international climate negotiations and the importance of our actions in the context of COP26 and what comes next. Perhaps you joined us a week ago for Sir Robert Watson and Christiana Figueres, who help put the stakes of climate change in context and provide a hopeful outlook for what needs to be done. It was an extraordinary conversation, and I encourage anyone who missed it to watch the archived webcast available at www.esi.org. Today, as I mentioned, our focus will be climate adaptation. And on Wednesday, October 20th, we will consider the important role of international climate finance, on Friday, October 22nd, we will describe the stakes of the negotiations set to begin in Glasgow. And after COP26, on Thursday, November 18th, we'll convene a briefing for an after action report about key outcomes and possible next steps. And don't forget to subscribe to that new daily newsletter, Glasgow Dispatch, to follow progress from COP26 from a congressional perspective. You can subscribe online at www.esi.org forward slash COP news. Today, we will start with opening remarks from Gonzalo Munoz. Gonzalo was appointed by the Chilean presidency of COP25 and the United Nations as a high level climate champion. In this role, Gonzalo mobilizes climate action in non-state actors around the world, which includes leading the race to resilience. The race to resilience is a global campaign that aims to catalyze a step change in global ambition for climate resilience, putting people and nature first in the pursuit of a resilient world where we don't just survive climate shocks and stresses, but we thrive in spite of them. Gonzalo is also the co-founder and executive president of Tricyclos, a B Corp certified business with a mission to foster new designs for a world without waste. So let me turn it over to hear these opening remarks. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you, Dan, for setting me up to give a few opening remarks to help kick off today's adaptation session. I'm really sorry I'm not able to join you in person, but thank you for the, to, to the Institute for allowing me to give a rallying call for climate adaptation. When the UK took over the COP presidency, I was really delighted that, that they made adaptation and resilience a key priority. We, we often speak of an ambition though, between state and non-fair state actors. The idea that we, if we demonstrate raised level of ambition from non-state actors, we can call upon states to do the same at these crucial climate moments like COP26 in, in Glasgow. So for this to be a truly decisive moment of climate action, though, we have to answer the call of the climate crisis with action on both mitigation and adaptation. We cannot rely on just one of the two, and they are so much interlinked, we know that. This is one of the reasons we set up the Race to Resilience in January of this year, that to, to run alongside the mitigation focus Race to Zero campaign, both, both as siblings campaigns. So to rally leadership and, 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 and of course, support from cities, region, businesses, and, and investors to help frontline communities build resilience and adapt to the climate of uh, the impact, sorry, of climate change, such as extreme heat, draw, flooding, and, and sea level rise. Uh, Race to Resilience, the, the campaign uh, goals to, to, is to catalyze a step change in global action by non-state actors to build the resilience to climate shocks of 4 billion people from vulnerable groups and communities by 2030 for them to not only survive the crisis, but thrive despite of it. The good news to report is that awareness and momentum on climate adaptation is growing. So since we launched the Race to Resilience, we had 24 partner initiatives join the campaign representing over 2,500 organizations and taking action in over 100 cities, uh, sorry, countries, 100 countries. So this includes partners like the World Research Institute, who are part of uh, Initiative uh, 2020, who are changing the dynamic and of land degradation in Latin America and the Caribbean by beginning to protect and restore 40, uh, 50 million hectares of forest farm pastures and, and other landscapes by, by 2030. So within the, US, the United States, we have majors and, and mayors and, and governors stepping up as part of the Stream Heat Resilience Alliance and Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance to protect the communities from, from climate change impact. 
So one point I, I want to get across here is that when it comes to adaptation and resilience, it doesn't matter where you live or operate. The systems we all rely on are absolutely interconnected. We are only as strong as the most vulnerable among us. And that is so, so real all around the world. These are challenges which requires um, really coordinated responses across all level of government and internationally. Uh, and, and I think that we have learned so much from the COVID crisis as well, right? This is where we call upon you policymakers to continue to bang the drum uh, on climate adaptation and resilience. The, the race to resilience recognizes the outside role of uh, policymakers have in making the decisions of government as effective as possible. This is why at the start of the campaign, we had some clear policy recommendations taking from the great work of the Global Commission on Adaptation and, uh, and the Marrakesh Partnership Resilience Pathways. We need to ensure early warning and action against climate disasters are in place for 1 billion people in developing countries by 2025. And climate finance reaches the most vulnerable by developing locally led adaptation plans. This is an area where the risk informed early action partnership is taking a leading role. And, uh, and climate proof key infrastructure and services, including actions by developing countries where water resources need to be resilient to climate risks. We need to increase the resilience of all urban settlements by 2030, which with very specific plans to manage the risk of heat waves by 2025. These are just some of the ways we can make our communities resilient to climate change. And I know today's session will look at how we can go from ideas to really concrete and urgent implementation. Of course, none of this happens without a mobilization of finance. And so let me make that my final message. We must close the finance gap between mitigation and adaptation. This is not just the right thing to do, but absolutely the smart thing to do. Benefit cost ratios on investment adaptation range from two to uh, two to one to ten to one. So absolutely the smart thing to do. And this is meant investments we know create what's what, all what the states want: jobs, safer communities, and and regenerate nature. So with that, I will hand back over to Dan and and say thank you again to the EESI uh, and and the British Embassy in Washington for convening this event to highlight work on adaptation and resilience in the lead up to COP26. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gonzalo. It's great to hear from you today. And we definitely wish uh, you could be with us in person. Um, hopefully someday soon, we'll be able to convene and talk about all of these events on Capitol Hill with our congressional audience in the room at the same time. But means a lot that you were able to take some time out of your schedule to join us today and to share those messages. And we totally agree. And I really appreciate that you ended on the message of climate finance, which is something we'll address next week um, on Wednesday at our next briefing. So thank you very much for that. Um, it is now my privilege to introduce the first of our three panelists um, who will be joining us today to talk about um, climate adaptation and um, the work that remains to be done uh, coming up at COP26. COP so I'd like to introduce Ben Webster. Ben Webster has worked in the humanitarian sector since 2003 and within the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement since 2012. He's worked in emergency contexts in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and the Caribbean, and held roles such as head of emergencies and head of climate adaptation and early action at the British Red Cross. Ben is now the head of secretariat for the Risk-Informed Early Action Partnership, which aims to make 1 billion people safer from disaster by 2025. And he's passionate about improving and scaling up anticipatory action for the communities most affected by disasters and crises. Ben, welcome to our briefing today. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for the introduction. Can you see my slides okay? Yes. Perfect. So as uh, Gonzalo mentioned, um, we are often focused on mitigation, reducing carbon emissions when we talk about climate change. Um, but I'm really glad that this session is focused on climate change adaptation because uh, a large amount of the um, carbon emissions are baked in now and therefore we will be facing uh, inevitable climate change in the years to come. And as mentioned, I come from a humanitarian background and I've seen firsthand the impacts uh, of extreme weather events around the world 
Um, and so according to the World Meteorological Organization, just last year, more than 30 million people were displaced by climate related disasters. Um, and in the coming 10 years, uh, some 325 million people, really poor people, will be living in 49 of the most hazard prone countries um, in the world. Uh, and the cost of adaptation is, is really increasing as well. The cost of climate change is really ramping up. Um, so there's already an annual estimated cost of $70 billion per year being um, paid for climate change impacts, uh, but that could soar to over 300 billion by 2030. And it's not just the poorest countries who are being impacted. We've seen this year uh, with the floods in Europe, the heat waves in, in North America, last year, the wildfires in Australia, um, all of us are impacted by the changing climate. Uh, and therefore we do need to adapt as a matter of urgency. Now in Gonzalo's presentation, he mentioned the economic aspect as well, the benefit cost ratio of some of these adaptation measures, and they range from two to one to 10 to one. Um, now, if we look at this graph from uh, the Global Commission on Adaptation, it actually shows that that um, highest benefit cost ratio is for investment in early warning systems. Um, and so there's real focus at the moment from the World Meteorological Organization, from crews, from other initiatives uh, to really improve the, the infrastructure and systems that we have around the world um, to, to raise early warning alerts when we know that there are extreme weather events uh, on the horizon. Um, but those early warning systems are only as strong or as useful as the early action that they trigger. Um, so coming from the humanitarian background, um, we've seen in recent years some of the agencies within the Red Cross Red Crescent movement, UN agencies like WFP and FAO and civil society organisations as well, starting to use those early warning systems to trigger early action. Um, so this is action that is based on a forecast or collective risk analysis. Um, it uh, takes place before the hazard strikes. So rather than waiting for the floods to arrive and then responding reactively after the fact, um, action can take place actually before the hazard strikes to reduce the impact. And all the evidence is showing that this saves lives, it protects livelihoods, uh, it assures the, the development gains and the resilience gains that have been made in the longer term. And it's more cost effective as well. It's much cheaper, um, more efficient to deliver assistance in advance of the impact of the hazard rather than waiting for it to strike and then responding after the fact. So what this looks like, for instance, in Bangladesh um, last year, uh, there were forecasts of floods hitting particular rural communities and the UN SURF, the Central Emergency Response Fund, was able to trigger in a matter of hours um, to support both WFP and the Bangladesh Red Crescent and some local civil society actors to provide assistance to the, the communities that were likely to be imp impacted before the floods actually arrived. And all the evidence is showing with the evaluations that have taken place um, since, since the operation that it's been much more effective uh, in terms of reducing people's vulnerability and improving their ability to recover quickly and so on. The problem with these approaches is that they've remained at pilot or project level to date. And therefore, in 2019, at the UN Climate Action Summit, um, the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership was born to try and take these approaches to scale, uh, recognising that we cannot work in silos and and expect to take these approaches to scale. We have to bring together the climate community, the development community, the humanitarian community to bridge um, those different silos and work together if we're really to see uh, these approaches taken to scale and realize the benefits. So the partnership actually brought together governments, civil society, international organizations, and importantly, private sector as well, like the insurance and reinsurance industries to see if we can really start adopting um, these practices and embedding them with, within policy and practice at a national level. So the partnership was launched with these four overarching targets. 
Target one is ensuring that at least 50 countries by 2025 um, have integrated their climate change adaptation and disaster risk management policies, plans, and legal frameworks so that we can reduce the impact of, of climate change on people and the environment. Target two is around linking the financial instruments that need to be in place that can trigger ahead of those hazards impacting and linking them to effective early action plans so that we know that resource can help protect people before the hazards strike. And then targets three and four around improving the early warning systems, making sure that they are really targeting last mile communities. Well, what's traditionally been known as last mile communities, we want to flip that on its head and make sure that those last mile communities are actually the first mile, the first consideration when we design early warning systems uh, and that everything that we do in the international community is to support those communities to take action and protect themselves. So those were the four targets launched. What we do as a partnership, what we focus on, um, number one, really generating momentum behind this agenda. Um, when you explain it to people, it's, it's a no brainer. Why would we not uh, re take action and respond when we know there's a credible forecast that something's going to happen. Um, it's, there's a moral imperative to act, but how, how are we going to do this? So we're generating the political momentum using events and opportunities to make sure that governments are supporting these approaches, that we are bedding the, embedding them into policy and practice, um, and really seeing this, this uh, momentum grow towards supporting the agenda. Secondly, creating an enabling environment. What are the practical things we can put in place um, to really enable this, um, this approach to flourish and to be taken to scale? Uh, so for instance, developing guidance and criteria for the donors so that they know they're investing effectively to be able to support um, these approaches. Uh, what are the policies that need to be in place at a national level? Where is the good practice uh, that has enabled um, early action to be taken to scale. So we're currently um, providing case studies in different contexts to really analyze, um, you know, what is it that constitutes an enabling environment and how do we replicate that in different places. And finally, because we've got such a broad partnership covering government, civil society, private sector, international organizations, we've tried to create a marketplace function where um, slightly unusual uh, partners and suspects can, can work together more effectively across these different silos, can understand each other, partner more effectively so that together we can start to deliver this um, at scale. So in terms of COP, COP26, what needs to happen on the adaptation agenda? Um, there are many things that need to come out of COP this year, really key opportunity for us. Um, but these would be some of the, the main aspects that I would like to flag today. I mean, the Paris Agreement um, has been agreed and we all want to see it achieved, but we really need the concrete NDCs and NAPs that are going to help deliver that. So more countries coming forward with their national adaptation plans. Um, obviously, as a partnership, we want to see these risk-informed approaches being included in the national adaptation plans. But this is where um, the rubber will hit the road and we really want to see concrete action being taken um, of how we're going to reach the Paris Agreement. Secondly, um, providing equal focus on mitigation and adaptation. As Gonzalo mentioned, the race to resilience um, is as important as the race to zero uh, and therefore there has to be equal focus on mitigation and adaptation. Um, we know that the, the impacts of climate change are coming and many people, millions of people around the world are already facing um, the impacts and therefore we have to adapt right now. Thirdly, um, the $100 billion that was promised by rich countries still hasn't been achieved uh, and to sustain trust within the parties, uh, that has to be delivered. Um, so we want to see that, that gap bridged and, and the resource being provided in terms of international climate finance. Um, as mentioned already, the finance needs to focus on mitigation and adaptation as well. And the UN Secretary General is calling for 50% um, of all international climate finance to be focused on adaptation. There's still a way to go before we, we reach that. And therefore, um, that needs to be a focus at COP to really focus minds on that goal. 
Um, an acknowledgement that loss and damage is a very real issue. So no matter how well we adapt in the longer term, there will be residual risk and we have to be able to manage that risk. And where um, there is loss and there's damage, uh, where coral reefs um, are you know, dying out and where communities are having to be moved completely, um, there is a, a price to be paid and we have to ensure that those communities um, who experience loss and damage uh, are being supported with concrete actions and measures being taken. And then finally, COP itself, um, the process needs to be fair and equitable, inclusive and transparent. As mentioned, trust is so important in this entire process uh, and therefore we need to have that um, transparency and, and the inclusion incorporated into the negotiations um, to ensure that we can achieve these, these outcomes that everybody wants to see. In terms of REAP and what we want to achieve um, through COP, so as a partnership, we have over 50 partners now from those different groups that I mentioned. Um, we want to cast a vision of what does early action at scale look like? Uh, we want to inspire countries who have not um, heard about this agenda so far, uh, why should they get engaged and, and what does this really look like at scale? We want to showcase examples from our different partners around the world to bring it to life um, and help explain what does this look like in reality, in practice. And we want to provide an opportunity to demonstrate commitments and pledges um, from those supporters of the early action agenda. Um, so that is what we will aim to do through various events at COP26 um, and we really hope to increase the momentum so that we can see those 1 billion people made safer from disaster by 2025. Um, I look forward to questions at the end of the session but right now I'll hand back to Dan and to my uh, fellow speakers. Thank you. Thank you Ben. That was an awesome presentation. Um, and um, thank you for the segue into Q&A. We will have a Q&A discussion. I'll be joined by my colleague Anna again a little bit later and we'll um, talk with our um, panelists and ask them lots of good questions. And um, there's also a way for members of our audience to answer, to ask questions as well. Um, if you'd like to ask a question of our panelists, there are two ways you can do that. One is by following us online on Twitter at EESI online and you can send us in a question that way. You can also send us an email to an email address, ask, ask at esi.org. It's an email address we use for briefings so that we can solicit questions. Um, whichever one you like, you can choose, um, but we will do our best to incorporate questions from the audience during the moderated discussion a little bit later. Um, ben made a great presentation. He had great slides. If you want to go back and revisit Ben's slides, um, and this goes for our other panelists as well, um, as well as an archived webcast, briefing materials, uh, presentation materials, and eventually written notes, summary notes will be available online. So if you wanna go back and dig back into Ben's slides, you can definitely do that by visiting us online at www.eesi.org. Um, our second panelist is uh, Tamara Koger. Tamara is a senior associate in WRI's climate resilience practice. She helps lead the Institute's work on locally led adaptation and other research and programs focused on adaptation and resilience. In her time with WRI, she has also worked on the Global Commission on Adaptation, managing strategic engagement in locally led adaptation, and is a monitoring, evaluation, and learning advisor, providing technical support to project design and evaluations across WRI. Her background is in climate and development policy, focusing primarily on climate change adaptation and mitigation within agriculture and food systems. Welcome to our briefing today. I'm really, really looking forward to your presentation. Great, thanks so much, Dan. Uh, let me just find my presentation here and try to share my screen. Okay, can you see that okay? It looks like you are in presenter mode. Okay. Um, try that again. <laughs> Okay, how's that? Yes, looks great. Okay, great. 
Um, great. Well, thanks. Thanks so much again for having me. Um, it's, it's really great to be here and, and um, great to have the chance to talk about this really important topic, adaptation um, in the lead up to, to COP26. Um, so, so thinking about, you know, about, about adaptation, um, as many of you know, when, when we're thinking about what's, what we're going to be seeing at COP26, what folks are going to be talking about, um, I think many of you have already heard, um, we're hearing calls for more finance for adaptation, right? Gonzalo mentioned um, this need to close the finance gap um, and that there's a need to recognize that while we're absolutely needing to cut emissions and, um, you know, um, and prevent further, further climate warming, um, that we also need to recognize that ecosystems, infrastructure, and very importantly, communities and people um, are already being affected by climate change. So we need to invest in adapting to climate impacts. Um, we're also hearing calls for more finance to the most vulnerable countries and communities is something that Gonzalo and Ben also mentioned, um, just recognizing the disproportionate impacts of climate change, especially in the global south. Um, and another call that is a bit more recent um, is a call for more adaptation that is locally led. Um, and so that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, WRI is working really closely with the UK, with the COP26 presidency, and also with partners, including um, IIED, um, to advance momentum on locally led adaptation in the lead up to COP and moving forward. Um, so why locally led adaptation? What is it? Um, if you haven't heard this term before. Um, so locally led adaptation is really about recognizing that the organizations, the local governments, farmers, coastal communities, um, the, the communities who are on the front lines of climate change who are facing these impacts directly, that they should be having agency uh, over the decisions that are directly affecting their ability to build resilience to climate change, um, as well as access to finance for adapting to climate change and other resources that they might need, like climate information, um, climate data, and institutional strengthening. Um, so, so it's about centering these these local partners, not just not just asking for their input, not just asking for their opinion, but really giving them agency over these decisions and and these investments. And um, and you know, households and communities around the world are actually the biggest uh, spenders on adaptation, uh, which makes this uh, particularly pertinent. Um, and you know, this is important. You know, not because you know, local actors are the ones who are on the ground facing these impacts. They have this nuanced understanding of the context on what solutions um, might work for them. And so, um, you know, with locally led adaptation, we're likely to end up with solutions that are more durable, sustainable in the long run, more suited uh, to the context, um, and, and that really bringing community ownership. Um, and this is true everywhere. You know, we, we talk about it often in an international context, but it's it's relevant in the U.S. in the global north as well. Um, this is really a truly global issue, and and um, aligns closely with calls we're seeing, for example, from the climate justice movement. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a New Englander. I'm speaking to you from Maine, so maybe I'll give a, an example um, for from here uh, from the the lobster industry, you know, I know we know that that lobster fishing has been um, affected by climate change, warming uh, waters have impacted the industry. And there have been efforts here in Maine to ensure that that fishermen and women are involved in informing planning efforts um, so that they can align their knowledge of the industry. They know what they need to be building resilience to climate impacts. They know firsthand the changing climate conditions that they're facing. Um, so bringing them into planning processes to align their firsthand knowledge of the industry with the climate science that they need to help them to adapt is sort of, you know, just, just one of many, many, many examples of kind of uh, the importance of, of making sure that we're prioritizing um, 
the, the climate risks and um, the priorities that, that local communities and actors are facing. So whether it's, you know, lobster fishers or people living in urban heat islands uh, or flood prone communities in the US, you know, this is really relevant um, across the board and across the range of climate risks that, um, that we're facing. So you may be thinking, you know, okay, that, that's obvious. <laughs> um, that makes a lot of sense. We should absolutely be centering local communities who are facing climate risks. Um, I agree. Um, but the problem is that the status quo of funding for adaptation and planning and decision-making processes just isn't supporting this right now. Um, it's pretty top-down and it's making it hard for local actors to access finance and to influence decisions. Um, and this is true even, even in the case of well-intentioned donors who are trying to reach communities but still facing challenges and really um, making changes that are required and really um, making sure that, that the focus is on the agency and, and decentralizing decision-making power to those local communities. Um, so, so I've, you know, put some stats here on the screen, which I think, um, kind of summarize it well, um, that, that we're, that we're not seeing the finance that that's needed. Um, and just to be clear, you know, this is not, not about saying that everything adaptation needs to be happening at the most hyper, you know, local level. Um, but it is about acknowledging that, that what we're seeing currently, that levels of finance are clearly not nearly enough um to to um support the needs that frontline communities have um, and so we just need to 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 find a better balance and um improved coordination across levels um to to make sure that that we are putting these priorities at the center um and you know this is not just not just me not just wri um, this slide just shows some examples um, that we're seeing uh, from a number of um, papers that have come out in recent years, uh, which are putting forward similar, similar calls, um, having similar findings and recogni uh, recommendations, uh, recognizing the need to, to decentralize finance and structure it in a way that is more conducive to supporting local actors. Um, so one thing I wanted to, to flag that, that WRI has been working on is these eight principles for locally led adaptation. This is something um, that we have co-developed with organizations like IED, BRAC International, Slum Dollars International, and the International Center for Climate Change and Development, and with input from a really, really diverse set of partners um, under the Global Commission on Adaptation. Um, and, and that's moved forward quite a bit. Um, so this gets to the, the what do we do about it? Um, the eight, these eight principles are really meant to sort of break down what is required for, um, for donors, for climate funds, for all of us who, who recognize that this is important, what can we actually do um, to make sure that, that finance and decision-making processes are supporting locally, local actors? Um, and as you can see, I won't, won't go through them in too much detail, but, but it gets to aspects of planning and decision making, of addressing structural inequalities, recognizing that that's not necessarily a given, um, of flexibility in funding and in programming, uh, transparency and accountability. So um, these principles were launched earlier this year at the Climate Action Summit in January um, and have continued to, to gain some momentum, but are intended to serve as sort of a foundation uh, for, for action in this space moving forward. Um, the good news, uh, the great news, is that uh, locally led adaptation and, and these principles are really picking up steam. Uh, we're seeing increasing um, calls and, and support globally uh, for locally led adaptation. Um, a couple other examples, um, you know, from different communities, including um, political actors around the world. So we mentioned that this is something that the COP26 presidency is 
putting at, at the heart of their adaptation and resilience priorities and adaptation loss and damage day. Um, it's been mentioned by the Climate and Development Ministerial. Um, it was also mentioned in the recent uh, G7 communique, the principles for locally led adaptation were recognized as a uh, useful framework for adaptation. There's other initiatives, um, including the Adaptation Action Coalition and the Race to Resilience, uh, which many of you may be familiar with, which, um, which are also supporting locally led adaptation. So this is really exciting. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really great to see that this movement is growing. I think, I think it really is, a, is indeed um, a movement um, that we're seeing growing and, and gaining traction um, in the lead up to COP26. Um, this slide just shows some, um, all of the endorsements, the formal endorsements that we have for the principles of locally led adaptation. We have um, upwards of, I believe it's actually 57 now, uh, endorsements of the principles, and, and these range from the most local grassroots actors that we've been working with throughout this process to climate funds, to governments who are sort of stepping forward and, and committing to making changes to put these principles for locally led adaptation um, into practice. Um, and here are the, the principles again, just some subliminal messaging to, to reinforce, reinforce this. Um, and turning, turning back to COP26 and, and the, the priority um, that this is and that, that we're expecting to see, you know, um, I think the, the, couple, the couple pieces where um, we'll be seeing COP, uh, locally led adaptation featured at COP um, include efforts to really amplify voices from the front line. So this entails um, featuring examples of uh, organizations who are uh, leading efforts on the ground to adapt to climate change and, and really showcasing those stories. So it's not just, um, you know, hearing from those who, who already kind of um, have access to that platform, but really giving a platform to local partners who bring that expertise in adaptation, who have experience and knowledge to share, bringing that to COP26 and, and using COP as a, as a platform to share those experiences and share those lessons learned, um, including at Adaptation Loss and Damage Day. So um, this is something that's, that's great to see as a, as a priority um, at COP and, and moving forward. Um, we're also seeing dedicated spaces and discussion for locally led adaptation. This is something that's relatively new compared with previous, um, previous COPs, including at the Resilience Hub um, and also um, a, a dedicated pavilion on locally led adaptation. And we're also expecting to see more um, endorsements and support for locally led adaptation um, at these various events. Um, and, and hoping um, and expecting to see not just um, endorsements and, and COP26 is an opportunity for um, actors to be stepping forward to support this, but also to, to translate that into action um, moving forward. Um, so looking ahead, what does this look like? You know, COP26 is, is one really important milestone. It's, it's really exciting to see locally led adaptation so prominently featured. Um, but um, we expect it to, to be, to, to be um, sort of a, a catalyst for, for continued momentum in this space. Um, so WRI with partners is uh, leading a large community of practice and bringing together the diverse actors who are working on this space um, and, and looking to work together to, to continue to build this movement and advocate for locally led adaptation and the changes needed. Um, we're expecting to see um, growing commitments and actions. So now that we have these principles, we have these endorsements, it's about how do we operationalize them and actually put them into practice. Um, we've been holding a series of, of dialogues over the past two months 
um, that are aiming to really get at kind of what's needed and what are some ideas and changes that could be put forward um, and that should be invested in. So um, that's something that we'll be working on moving forward it is actually identifying these opportunities to invest in, in some of these changes and, um, and make the financing and decision making changes that, that need to be made um, to support local actors. And then also strengthening the evidence and knowledge base around locally led adaptation. You know, I mentioned that, that there are these great examples um, with partners we've identified, you know, over 100 examples of locally led adaptation um, happening around the world. So we're, we're looking to be kind of um, compiling those lessons learned and, and strengthening the evidence base so that we can really um, have, a, have a stronger foundation for um, uh, good practice for more equitable and effective local led adaptation moving forward. Um, so um, yeah, this is a really exciting space. Um, looking forward to answering any additional questions that, that folks have and, and um, hope to stay engaged in this moving forward. Thanks so much. Thanks for your presentation, Tamara. That was excellent. Really appreciate it. And we will definitely have questions. But before we get to questions, um, two things. One, a reminder, everything will be available online, www.esi.org, including tomorrow's excellent slides. And if you have a question, there's still an opportunity to um, ask us. You can follow us on Twitter at EESI online. You can also send us an email. Um, and the email address to use is ask, A-S-K, at EESI.org. Um, and now I, we will turn to our third presenter of the day, Carlos Sanchez. Carlos is executive director for the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. It's a flagship COP26 initiative, CCRI, led by the private sector and has a membership of 100 institutions representing 20 trillion with a T dollars committed to the development and testing uh, of solutions for resilient investment decision making. Carlos is also the Climate Resilience Investment Director at Willis Towers Watson, where his work focuses on the integration of physical climate risks and asset valuation and investment decision making processes. Carlos, welcome to our present or welcome to our briefing tonight. Great to see you. Dan, an absolute pressure. Thank you so much uh, to you, to e ESI, uh, the, uh, the British Embassy in, in DC, that I must say, beyond the, their support to, to this event, they've been an absolute core partner and a critical one. To, to whatever level of preliminary success uh, CCR is delivering. And thank you everyone that, that, is, uh, that is joining us today for, for this session. So I'll be delighted to share with you the work of the coalition and also uh, the, the, our vision uh, towards, towards COP, but also maybe most critically even uh, beyond COP. So I will assume that you can all see uh, my screen and I will proceed with the presentation. So let me, let me start with the critical and fundamental information about the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. And that is, what is the problem being addressed? Uh, what is the mandate? What is the scope and approach? And what is the status and membership? So with regard to the problem being addressed, uh, the, the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment works on the assumption that we are facing a market failure, a market failure in the form of imperfect information being taken for decision making and imperfect information with regard to physical climate risk. So in other words, starting with the physics story, as we can call it. So how an exposure to a certain hazard is not only today, which in some cases we even struggle to understand current exposure to both uh, chronic and acute risk, but more important to decision making, how that is going to evolve to years 5, 10, 15, 20, and beyond. Uh, because we don't have a clear and consistent picture of how those exposures are going to evolve. Then also the interpretation in terms of financial materiality, and that is at any level of decision making. So financial materiality has clearly a connotation of the financial industry, but we could apply it to any cost benefit analysis for any type of decision making. The process of understanding that level of exposure into that materiality is very much undermined. And ultimately, what this results into uh, imperfect and not fully efficient incentive structures, which fundamentally are regulation and cost of capital to both reward and enforce the right pricing of physical climate risk. So, in essence, we face a very acute mispricing of physical climate risk, and the coalition uh, wants to, and is doing, developing 
practical solutions led by the private sector in partnership with key public institutions and really relying on a pre-competitive, true collaborative approach across industry, sectors, institutions, developing those practical solutions that are uh, certified to facilitate a better integration of physical climate risk in investment decision making. Our scope is really much of a global scope and I really like the presentation from Tamara and Ben uh, for many reasons but but also because it was capture the notion that the, the discussion about resilience is not anymore exclusive to, to develop in emerging frontier market but also to develop nations. There are different levels of vulnerability but exposure is certainly uh, uh, relevant to both. So we have a global exposure and we deliver to both developed and developing uh, regions. Uh, we work on physical climate risk alone and the reason is that we believe it's a very, uh, these are very particular animals compared to transition risk and mitigation and they deserve a very dedicated effort and once that is better understood then we can integrate, then we must integrate with other uh, type of risks. Um, the, all solutions need to be a public good, uh, need to be open source data, uh, regardless of how strategic and how commercially interesting this may be for any actors. This is signed as an MOU within the, the coalition. Uh, as Dan said, we are absolutely delighted to be a flagship COP26 initiative. At the heart of it is really our incredible partnership with the UK government that really brought us to the stage in, at the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019 and has supported us all throughout this period. So we have really no words to, to, to thank them. How this translates, practically speaking, because all this is a very nice narrative and it's a good framing, but how does it translate into practicality of delivering something that is meaningful and that informs practical decision making? We have divided our work into three key areas. Um, that we could characterize as national planning, national decision making, or as we call systemic resilience at the project level or asset level in what we call the asset design and structuring working group. And then at the financing level where it is a financial innovation working group. And before going into, uh, into the specific deliverables, let me just speak to the interconnectivity and the rationale for working into this. So we believe that at the national level, it is absolutely crucial that we provide the solutions to governments for them to better apply to critical activities. The assessment of exposure of national value to physical climate risk in, in critical time horizons and the management of that exposure. We cannot focus only on the assessment, um, particularly with developing countries where we certainly have a, a, a focus uh, that is extremely dangerous, is what we call the risk of price and risk. So if you only showcase what is the underlying risk in a certain jurisdiction, risk is that sovereign ratings will go down, capital will be crowded out, and this will be a disaster. So that is hence why it's absolutely critical to provide the solutions for better management of national exposure to physical climate risk. And I will be speaking very quickly in, uh, about the, the specifics very, very shortly. Um, but what is critical here is that what we need to obtain is a prioritization exercise. It's to help governments to understand how constrained fiscal resources can be better and most efficiently deployed to maximize the protection of economic, social, and we must always recognize also ecosystem value from physical climate risk. The second working group, asset level, works on, the, on a different question. is once you have recognized what are the priorities, what does it mean to invest, to invest in each of those in a resilient way? And that really is a total different approach that really goes into the structure, into the engineering, and into the cash flow modeling of specific assets. And I will be speaking about that very quickly. And then at the financing level is the recognition that a capital instrument can and have a vast uh, margin to improve and to innovate, not to only facilitate the raising of capital, but actually that that capital is catalytic in, in really driving a different recognition, reward, and integration of physical climate risks. And, and on the back of this, it's also crucial to highlight the uh, a difference between mitigation and adaptation or resilience. And that is, and, and I believe it's been well put and structured, I believe that it was by Ben, that, that mitigation has very well established metrics. Mitigation investment have very well understood risk return profiles. With resilience, we don't have those metrics yet. Um, and with resilience, we still struggle to validate the quality of the capital. So while in mitigation investment, we are speaking about the quantity of capital, in resilience investment, we still need to talk about the quality of the capital, the efficiency of the capital to, to deliver 
resilience. In any case, let me go into the first uh, area of work, that is the, the national decision making, and, and as we call it, the systemic resilience forum. This, this work really brings together critical actors, and that is governments, both OECD and non-OECD, that is international organizations, where we have 12 uh, important international organizations, financial actors that validate and, and guide the discussion, and technical experts into, in the different areas of expertise that are needed. What, what is being developed here are these two solutions, the systemic resilience metric. So again, back to the previous framing, we need a metric that helps guide what is the national value at risk in a given jurisdiction. But not only that, we also need the investment prioritization tool that tells us how every dollar will more efficiently improve the result of the metric. So as you can see, there is a very strong interdependency between the two. And that interdependency is crucial for public decision making, for governments that oftentimes say, we have 90% of our decisions are non-climate related, and these are competing for fiscal resources. How can we argue to increment the support to resilience if we don't see that reflected in any consideration uh, on crucial metrics for their decision making? And that is to some extent true that that is a problem. So this combination of the tool and the metric should provide what we could characterize as the political return on resilience. And that is an immediate and proportional reflection and recognition for that integration of physical climate risk into national planning and national decision making. And then we go to the second element of connectivity that is between systemic resilience metric and critical macro indicators. We totally understand and recognize, as Ben and Tamara highlighted, that, that there is an incredible dimension that is about the social exposure, the most vulnerable. And, and that needs to be recognized that that is oftentimes missed in GDP calculation. So that needs to be embedded into that as well as ecosystem value at risk. But we need to be able to have a connectivity of an element of proxy measure of this systemic resilience metric with calculations on, on macro indicator, so GDP inflation interest interest rate. Um, an example, and, and we are finishing, um, and we are gonna be presenting this at COP, a national investment prioritization tool in Jamaica. So basically, uh, led by the University of Oxford with the support of the UK government and the Green Climate Fund, we are developing a, a tool that assesses three infrastructure networks. So we take energy, water, transport in Jamaica. We georeference all the assets contained within those networks. We applied a network modeling interdependency uh, or cascade effect analysis. So basically understanding how an asset by virtue of being connected is also exposed. And then we apply economic value to different sections of that network to then obtain a sense of prioritization. As you can see on the top right hand of your screens, the, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Holness of Jamaica has been speaking uh, quite quite prominently about about this work, and we are totally honored by, by by that. And this is going to be the first of a series of of tools of this of this of this type that we're going to be piloting, actually, in both OECD and non OECD jurisdictions. So very interesting and very exciting progress at the asset level. At the asset level, as we said before, is a total different discussion. And here, what we need to do is to enhance a framework for the integration of physical climate risk into cash flow modeling practices. Uh, we have advanced uh, these three solutions. And the third one is the one that is still missing a 20% of development, but the, the other two are, are completed. And we are incredibly excited uh, for that. So the first one is the PCRAM, is a physical climate risk assessment methodology. So it's a tool that would be applied to an, an asset and we'll be able to interrogate how that asset and its capex, opex depreciation levels are according to its exposure over its lifespan. And not only that, but also issue recommendations in terms of incremental investment. The second is a work with SMP, uh, where we have advanced the resilience credit quality drivers that facilitates a simulation of credit quality uh, benefits associated to certain investments and improvements in an asset. And the third is the asset valuation principles for resilience that basically informs how an investment analyst or, or, or a public investor uh, integrates these, uh, these outputs from the other uh, deliverables into the cash flow modeling and the valuation of the asset. Just to give you an idea of the uh, of the uh, of how this is articulated and, and, and let's say model 
within uh, within the, this work. We have done this with, uh, we were offered 39 real projects uh, worldwide, properly diversified by infrastructure asset type, region, hazard, capital structure, and, and stage of development of the asset. And we selected an initial set of five. And, and in these five, uh, of which we have four about to be finished, and we are gonna be presenting this in, in, in Glasgow, um, they have followed this same process. And, and by virtue of following this process is that we have shaped these very interesting solutions. So starting with climate risk data and climate risk assessment, we are privileged to work with seven climate risk data providers that are delivering pro bono assessments of risk for each of these case studies. And, and even they are collaborating between themselves. So we are assigning them in pairs to different case studies. So they are mandated to deliver to us a consistent, a harmonized assessment of risk for a given asset. Um, with that, we have developed the PICRAM that again uh, does these uh, three fundamental things. Uh, provides a meteorality assessment. So really tells us if that investment and that structuring is according to its level of exposure. Uh, issues a resilience option. So it's a menu that you can be, uh, you can see very much an itemized and, and with a price tag in the form of Delta CapEx, Delta OPEX, how these solutions could be integrated into the asset. And then uh, implements an early sensitivity analysis for the investment. All these solutions, particularly the resilience options, are then taken by the cost of capital or the S&P resilience credit quality driver that basically will tell us which of those solutions or combination of those really result into the most efficient improvement of credit quality. And then on the back of that, we go to the asset valuation principles. And, and that is basically providing guidance to investors as in how to uh, implement this. We are not yet recommending adjustments to discount rates or cash flow projections, but that is certainly what we are going to be recommending down, down the road. Uh, there are two components that are uh, uh, applicable depending on the type of asset, that is the revenue impact. So really analyzing how uh, the revenue projections really properly integrate physical climate risks, and then insurability, that is to uh, uh, explore how risk transfer solutions can really be mobilized, not to allocate risk on a short and duration basis, but actually to enhance cash flow predictability at a, at a lifetime, uh, on a lifetime basis. And, and, and I believe that both again, Tamara and Ben spoke to the importance of this. I must say that insurance is a, is a very important component of the solution, but certainly not necessarily the, the, the solution uh, itself. Um, let, me, let me now speak a, a, a little bit about what is coming next and the level of momentum that we have uh, enjoyed and we are very thankful for. So the backdrop here is the launch of the uh, of CCRI at the UN Climate Action Summit back in 2019. Uh, and then you have a, a couple of uh, uh, connectivity or representation of the level of support, apart from the governments of Canada, Australia, UK, Jamaica, Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, we, we are very pleased to have the, the endorsement from the G7 and, uh, and certainly a, a very important uh, element of support and encouragement. And also we've been working very closely with the state of California. We are incredibly thankful for the partnership with the state of California, with the Governor Nism's office and the, uh, and, the, and the true support that has been facilitated in so many different areas. Um, Similarly, we're incredibly honored and, 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 and pleased to see that in the recent uh, report from the state of California's climate related risk disclosure advisory group, there was, there was uh, a vast uh, coverage of uh, the work of CCRI and, and to the point that there was even uh, a recommendation that was uh, referring to physical climate risk assessment methodology of CCRI, as you can see on the right-hand side of your, uh, of your screens. And, and that is certainly an indication of what is coming and what is, and what is happening. Um, I, will, uh, I will finish with this, with this slide, and I will add uh, with this slide on, on our screens, what is our level of ambition to COP, and certainly what is coming after and, and, and what we hear in terms of feedback from, from partners. Because as you can see here, we have a very diversified set of supporters, 120 representing again, 20 trillion in assets. And, and we spent a lot of time in curating different industries, sectors, institutions. 
And what you cannot see here is certainly the level of support that, that we have benefited from. There are a number of institutions that have contributed with seven, eight, nine colleagues over a year period to the advancement of CCRI uh, solutions. Um, the, the reason for that is certainly that the, the, there is a perception that CCRI is de developing something that is strategic and is strategic to governments and it's strategic to investors in that there is a recognition that um, the, there is a systemic change happening with regard to resilience. There is a, there is given the promising progress in regulation, in analytics, in how rating agencies are starting to include this and overall the awareness and uh, a recognition and understanding of the topic. Uh, there is certainly, we will see a point in time, it will be next year, two years, three years, nobody knows exactly when, but when practices of integrating this risk into national planning and uh, asset uh, design and structuring is going to change. So many actors, jurisdictions and institution investors, they want to really take action now uh, and start applying the right level of assessment and management of that risk so that when that adjustment happens, they're they are in a, an advantage, an advantageous uh, position. Back to the point about uh, developing a most vulnerable countries. Uh, we spent a lot of time in supporting these countries to, to really uh, 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 acquire the understanding and technical ability, the solutions, and most critically, to attract the capital uh, for them to, to undertake the necessary investments in resilient um, infrastructure. Uh, with that, I can also speak about what is next because our ambition and mandate is not only to develop and deliver these solutions that of course is the, maybe the most challenging, but what we want to see and what we want to support is to pilot these solutions with the mobilization of real capital. And we are having discussions that are quickly evolving about uh, potential uh, large uh, investment facilities that would rely on CCRI solutions and that with that uh, we would see the mobilization application uh, and scale of CCRI solutions. It is what we call CCRI's leak of investment funds for resilience that would be a series of investment vehicles all uh, uh, linked by the joint and common uh, uh, adoption of CCRI solutions for the screening and assessment of projects and aligned with national priorities for, for, for resilience. And that at the same time, this uh, facility, this leak of investment fund will also benefit from some additional support uh, and incentive. So certainly a, a lot happening and, uh, and a lot to happen in the future, particularly in that practical application proof of concept and capital mobilization, that that is exactly what we most urgently uh, need. So with that, I believe I, I must stop there. Apologies then colleagues for maybe going a little bit uh, over the assigned time, but uh, thank you so much and I stop there. Well, it's okay, Carlos, um, it's no problem at all. Um, because now we're going to transition into um, our Q&A and this will give Ben and Tamara a chance to catch up <laughs> and uh, uh, equalize the, the quotas a little bit, but great presentation and really cool slides as well. And um, if anyone wants to go back and revisit those and um, especially the points you were making about how that, all of that structure actually is manifested in, in sort of real investments is very well laid out. You can access all of the materials um, on our website, www.esi.org. Let me invite um, our other panelists to turn their videos back on and Anna McGinn, my colleague at ESI, is actually going to lead us through our Q&A, not actually going to, she's done this many times before, she's going to lead us through our Q&A today. So Anna is a policy manager, our policy manager here at ESI. She works a great deal on adaptation and resilience issues and um, is a major driving force behind all of our COP efforts. So let me welcome Anna to our panel today and turn it over to her to begin our Q&A. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Uh, really excited to be here with our panelists and thank you for three um, really wonderful presentations and of course the great introduction from Gonzalo to get us going. So um, our first question I want to pose to you all today is we've heard from you that adaptation has really scaled up in recent years, which is exciting, but of course you've also highlighted that there's um, much work yet to do. So I'm curious to hear from you um, if each of you could share maybe one or two key steps that you see 
are kind of the most um, necessary next big things for us to be thinking about to advance adaptation work, whether that's, you know, key decisions at the COP or more work at federal or subnational levels or maybe more work in the private sector. I'm very curious to see um, what you all think on that. And maybe we'll go in the order that we um, presented in. So we'll start with you, Ben. Thanks, Anna. Um, and thanks again for the opportunity. So I think it's important to have this equal balance between COP and the negotiations process and that global conference and, and the process that fits behind it, but also the real world action as well. So I don't think we can put all of our eggs in that basket, as it were. We, we absolutely need to make real, real world progress at the same time. So I think COP's really important for issues that we've set out today you know achieving the 100 billion um, of international climate finance uh, equalizing the mitigation and the ad adaptation focus um, in commitments and you know tying those down but at the same time we have to keep working on what i refer to as creating the enabling environment what are the policies that need to be in place what's the real world action um, as carlos was talking about you know the um, the actual investment decisions that need to be taken to, to move us towards this more resilient future um, collectively ac across the globe. So um, from our perspective, we'll keep working with our partners to work out in each context, what does this look like? How do we turn this into reality? What are the policies that need to be in place, the financial resources available, the work and the plans on the ground to ensure that we can prepare people, communities, cities, governments, um, to be ready for the changing climate in years to come. Tomorrow we can jump over to you next. Great, yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think, um, you know, Ben, ben covered, it, covered it well. I think, um, you know, like you said, we've made a lot of progress in, in recent years, but there's still, there's still lots to do. Um, we, the Global Commission on Adaptation put out a report called Adapt Now in 2019, um, and, and three things that it called for, I think, are, are worth highlighting because I think they still stand and are still really useful in thinking about how, you know, what needs to happen, what we can continue to do to advance adaptation. Um, so this report called for three revolutions, uh, revolution in planning or in understanding, in planning and in financing for adaptation. Um, and I think those are three useful things to, to remember and that, that we can, can go back to, um, that, that we really need to focus on understanding climate risk, on planning ahead and thinking about what needs to be done to address those climate risks, and then also really rethinking financing, um, both in terms of the, the quantity of financing that, that we've mentioned a lot, um, but we haven't talked so much about the quality of finance, um, and that's another piece that, that I would um, recommend um, that we focus on and, and that um, hope to see moving forward. And, and this is something that we think about a lot when it comes to locally led adaptation as well. It's, it's not about just making sure that finance is reaching the right actors, that it's reaching local communities, but that it's structured in a way that that it's able to act, that local actors are able to access that finance, that it's flexible enough, um, that it's not so restrictive, um, that it's patient and long term and predictable. So all those elements of quality, I think, are also important to focus on. Very hard to follow uh, uh, ben, uh, ben and Tamara because I really, really agree with uh, everything that that is being said. I mean, the point about the quality of cap of investment and, and finance is so crucial and something that we in, in this space uh, have historically struggled so much. In other words, to really prove that every dollar is maximizing that that delivery, either of social, economic, or ecosystem value, or or also to enhance risk adjusted returns to investor, which is also something that, that also needs to be considered if we really want to genuinely integrate uh, what maybe oftentimes is, is, is labeled too broadly as a private sector, where it's a, it's a very, very deep uh, universe of, of different constituents that, that, that go, into, go into that. But, but certainly, and, and also uh, on, on, on Ben's point, I think there is so much need to really bring this to the practicality. Uh, you know the, the the work of RIP. Um, th 
there is so much value and efficiency in integrating those solutions in maximizing what we could call then capex capex investment uh, you know that those considerations that that ben is bringing to us it, it are incredibly effective in really leading to an efficient and that quality of capital or capital quality of investment for for many actors but uh, if i may attempt to add something um i believe that we are reaching a point in the resilience space where we can we are approaching that need of a proof of concept point uh, we have the basis analytically, conceptually, and practically of what that could be of solutions that can address the problem of multi-stakeholder group. And that is a unique opportunity to then uh, have an open discussion between private and public about what can each part do uh, to, to really bring us to that proof of concept phase. So at the federal state uh, level, uh, and, and maybe not thinking about the particular uh, uh, nature of, of the U.S. Uh, and decision making, but broadly speaking, you know, we need to better align upstream and downstream uh, investment and planning decisions. So we integrate and understand that those projects that are uh, advanced are the ones that really make sense in a long-term value uh, uh, with regard to, to the country. Uh, but in essence, it, it is that we need to go into the practical side and uh, we don't need to be uh, absolutely perfect. We need to be within certain navigating beacons, particularly on the analytics and projection side, because action is, is really needed. And there is a lot of no regret value into, in, into any of these actions and, uh, and support to that. But I, I will leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Um, so our next question is um, about kind of equitable climate action. So what steps are being taken by your coalitions or partnerships to make sure that responses to climate impacts are equitable. And um, maybe we'll start with Tamara this time, and then we'll jump to Carlos and wrap up with Ben. Sure, I mean, this is something that, that we talk about a lot when we're, when we're talking about locally-led adaptation. Um, I think importantly, because locally-led approaches address one level or layer of inequity, you know, between where finance and decision making process are, are allocated and reaching, but but it doesn't inherently um, address structural social inequities, and and this is why this is principle number two. If it um, is about addressing structural inequalities, um, because it needs to be intentional. So I think sometimes when we talk about this space, there can be kind of an assumption that that you know. Um, that we're maybe conflating locally led adaptation with equitable approaches. And, and so we really strive to, to make sure that that's an added factor, that, that that's um, an intentional piece. Um, and there's lots of learning to do. I think lots of learning from experiences on the ground about what are some of these good practices, you know, what is it that we, that we need to be doing um, to make sure that we're building in those equity considerations from the beginning. Um, and so I think, you know, we're thinking about what what additional research we can be doing, um, who we need to be bringing in to, to make sure that equity is remaining a, a deliberate focus uh, of these conversations and that it doesn't get kind of lost uh, in the shuffle with, with things that are very closely related, um, but, but that we're having that dedicated space for, for equity considerations. If I may, um, so uh, within, the, within CCRI, um, the, the equity consideration is crucial, particularly at the systemic level. All, all our work and maybe drawing in the uh, example and the pilot in, in Jamaica, where basically, as I mentioned before, we are taking a select group of infrastructure networks and understanding exposure within those networks, not as a, as a measure of asset value, so the measure of how much of a bridge is worth and how, no, the value of social and economic continuity that relies on that, on that bridge that happens to be exposed. Uh, in that exercise, we really quickly identify huge challenges uh, in terms of integrating social uh, and equity considerations into, into that assessment, because we are naturally skewing against those most vulnerable communities that don't have access to infrastructure. So, you know, relying on existing infrastructure is the first issue there. So we are working and we have effectively addressed that with the University uh, of Oxford uh, to really also expand to understand where are communities that are not properly served by, by, by infrastructure to identify greenfield investments that are that are necessary. Then there was also the challenge in, in how to factor and, and assign 
social continuity to different sections of a given infrastructure network. And some measures and indicators that were considered were uh, probably about tax or about income. And that, of course, would have been a, an absolute disaster. So certainly, we are moving away from, uh, from those considerations. We still uh, must recognize that there is a challenge to measure and to find that indicator of social continuity or social flows. It can be just be a measure of amount of population relying on, on a certain infrastructure network. But again, there we maybe, you know, they're providing the same way that we want to really serve to those most vulnerable communities as stated as a priority by the, the government of Jamaica. At the asset level, it is true that um, we are working on case studies that are public assets and public investments. And for those, we are considering those social benefits as in a, a positive externalities associated to that investment being properly structured. Uh, but when we talk about private investments, it is much more contained within the traditional, let's say, risk adjusted return. And that nest also needs to be uh, properly, properly disclosed. But I, I stop there. And from my side, I guess there are three ways, one strategic, one in terms of our governance and one technical aspect. But in terms of the strategy, um, as I alluded to in the presentation, we're looking at people-centered approaches. Um, so one of our partners, Resurgence, has created a project or a program called Deraja where they're specifically looking at informal settlements and slum dwellings to make sure that early warning systems, the more formal, traditional early warning systems through MET services and so on, are also accessible in the informal settlements and finding different ways to communicate risk and so on. So really focused on people. And secondly, we've identified three drivers of change, global commitment on policy and practice, but secondly, country level ownership and leadership. So making sure that the most climate vulnerable countries are really driving this agenda. Um, so we work with Bangladesh, Malawi, Jamaica, St. Lucia, Fiji, um, you know, we really want to put those countries in the driving seat on this agenda. So first in terms of strategy. Second, in terms of governance, we ensure that our board has that broad representation across all of our partners, the donor countries, the recipient countries, the civil society actors, the international organisations, to ensure it is a collective endeavour to take these approaches to scale. And finally, technical aspect. I mean, we're, we've worked with specific partners on how do we integrate gender um, considerations into early action approaches and so on to make sure that, you know, as we develop these approaches um, going forward, we're really embedding all of those considerations into, into how this is operational. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I feel like we touched on so many different dimensions there, which was really wonderful. Um, I think I will send it over to Dan for our next uh, question. Cool, thanks, Anna. Um, so we've, again, three excellent presentations and a really great Q&A so far. Um, our audience, um, a lot of the things we've discussed so far are global in scope, right? We're talking about COP26, it's a United Nations convening, but a lot of our audience, especially those on Capitol Hill, um, are really focused on US domestic policy and sort of the intersection with sort of what the United States does domestically and what it does internationally. And I'm curious um, from your perspectives, um, how can the United States learn or benefit from these initiatives and the partnerships that you all are helping to coordinate? What is, what is the takeaway for an average Hill staff person so that when they're their boss asks them, why is international climate adaptation important? How does it relate to what's being done sort of here at home um, in, in the United States? And maybe Ben, we'll go back to you this time and we'll start and then we'll go back to Tamara and, and then to um, Carlos. Thanks, Dan. Um, and it's a good question, but from my perspective, this whole agenda around early warning, early action it is absolutely applicable domestically and internationally. Um, as we've said, you know, all of us are impacted by the changing climate and need to adapt. Um, and we're seeing that this whole area in, you know, much of the good practice is actually in the more disaster affected countries. So Bangladesh is leading when it comes to um, really integrating these approaches into their standing orders and their local level um, disaster plans and so on. 
Uh, and we saw, you know, in Europe with the, the floods this year, with heat waves, with wildfires, um, we can absolutely learn from each other. So I don't think, you know, this is just about um, poorer countries or the most vulnerable places. Uh, there's definitely applicability across the board. Um, and secondly, what I would say is that we're seeing one of the main issues is actually silos between government departments, between uh, teams, actors, decision makers. Um, that's on the international side, you know, when supporting other countries bilaterally or multilaterally, silos between government departments, you know, with climate and environment, humanitarian development, that creates issues, but also, you know, domestically between who's responsible for climate change adaptation, disaster risk management, the economic side, what which resources will trigger and when. Um, and therefore having this joined up holistic plan and integrating these risks into everything we do is absolutely crucial. And that is, you know, as relevant in the UK or the United States as it is anywhere else as well. So um, yeah, I think there are absolutely lessons to be learned here, but I'll pass over to you. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, to, to add on, I'll maybe keep my locally led adaptation hat on. Um, you know, this is relevant to the US. Uh, you know, there's obviously the, the uh, foreign assistance angle and how we can integrate locally led adaptation into, into our uh, work with international partners. Um, but this is also really relevant in the US, you know, small local organizations, local governments face the same types of challenges in accessing funding. We have the same sort of systemic barriers to um, agency and inclusion and decision-making processes. So again, for, the, for similar reasons, um, that if we want uh, adaptation efforts that are um, appropriate and relevant to the local context, that um, have ownership from local communities that are sustainable um, and that, that reflect these justice and equity issues that we've been talking about um, that, that is important to, to think about how we can make them more locally led. Um, you know, and I think this is recognized um, by, by many of the partners working on this and by the COP26 presidency. You know, I mentioned that at COP26 at Adaptation Loss and Damage Day, one of the, the ways that locally led adaptation is coming into play is um, by featuring, you know, these kind of stories from the front lines of climate change and, and showcasing, amplifying these, um, these experiences and local expertise. And there's been kind of a deliberate focus to, to bring in stories from the U.S. as well and, and Global North broadly to really um, kind of emphasize that this is truly, um, truly a global issue and, and relevant um, across the board. So I think, you know, here in the U.S. we have definitely a lot of learning that, that we can do, um, lessons learned from um, communities and, and countries that have been working on this. Um, so I think that's, you know, one really important opportunity. And I think, you know, this, this aligns really um, well with, with recent initiatives that have come out, you know, for example, the Justice 40 initiative of making sure that, that climate benefits are reaching disadvantaged communities here in the US. You know, so I think, I think there's, there's some there's momentum existing that we can build on um, and experiences that we can learn from to, to carry this forward. Indeed. Um, and if I may finish that this this round, I think that uh, certainly uh, is I totally agree. There is an absolute application at a domestic level. Uh, maybe me now speaking from a CCRI uh, standpoint. I wanted to highlight that, uh, as you have seen previously, we have a series of go governments and countries and jurisdictions that are OECD. And that I wanted to clarify that actually their contribution is not uh, OECD jurisdiction supporting non-OECD in, in improving. It's a, they are all uh, are benefiting and having the same exact interest in adopting uh, and piloting a CCRI solution. So when it comes to the US, uh, it is not only, you know, the US uh, learning or benefiting from, it's also uh, 
you know, as learning from the incredible level of expertise that that is housed in the in the U.S. and you know, in the House of Representatives. I, mean, I, I could speak of of a few incredible. Uh, highly respected professionals that are really having a, a, a very strong leadership in this in this space. So it's about really working together. But um, there there are discussions with other OECD jurisdictions where we are already speaking about at a domestic level the application of CCRA solutions in the upstream and downstream planning. Uh, of infrastructure and, and starting to see where the most value would be and then associated to that to see where a combination of private and public capital can be brought together. So, you know, in the US, all the all the very particular uh, muni, muni bond space, that is that is a particular important area where there is a lot of potential to, to mobilize investment for, for resilience. Um, so there is a lot to to learn and to collaborate, but truly uh, in, in a mutual benefit uh, basis. But I, I believe we're a little bit pressed with time. So Dan, I hand over to you. No, that's okay. And actually, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna risk going over by a minute or two because we got a question from the audience, our online audience. It's, it's just too good to pass up. And Tamara, you've already touched on it a little bit. And I think we can do this very quickly. The question is, we'll start with you Tamara because I think it's most closely related to what your presentation was about. This is a question for about subnational governments. And the question is, what specific messages um, could subnational leaders, and this, this person specifically mentions governors of US states, amplify at COP26 that would support the call that I think we all share for equal attention to adaptation? And so Tamara, if we could just do a quick lightning round, we'll start with you, and then if Ben or Carlos have other things that they would like to add. I just think that's such an interesting question and it's so timely and, and you've already been talking a little bit about it. So love to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think governors, other subnational actors are in a, a really um, good place to be carrying forward a lot of these messages. Um, you know, I would, you know, I would recommend reinforcing um, a lot of what we've talked about already about sort of the importance of recognizing climate risks and, and providing some of that context, because I think, especially in the US, um, there's there's a lot of there's a pretty broad range of risks that 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 we're facing, depending on where in the country you are. Um, so I think providing some of that context specificity and, and kind of how it how it's relevant um, to, to that local context. And I think um, being able to bring in um, uh, examples and priorities. So, so using COP26 as, a, as an opportunity to kind of um, put forward those, those priorities from local communities, um, you know, in respective states, um, especially the priorities of uh, more marginalized and disadvantaged communities um, who are on the front lines of climate change. So, so being able to express, you know, what are their priorities and, and what do we need to support them what are we learning um, from from these actors? Um, I think will be great to kind of reinforce a lot of these messages that we've been talking about today. And ben, Carlos, I'll give either of you the opportunity to have the last word if you'd like to add anything to what Tamara was just saying. Ben, I'll let, I'll let you go first. Thanks, Carlos. Um, I mean, just to say through the lens of risk and vulnerability and exposure, it does vary from state to state, city to city. And therefore, those leaders, um, those decision makers have a crucial role to play to work out what does this look like in their context. So for cities to become more resilient, for states to become more resilient, um, these issues and um, uh, principles have to be applied at that level. So, yeah, completely agree with tomorrow. Just, I'm, I'm not going to extend too much, Dan. So totally, totally agree. Just uh, we need to tailor very much that message to to what is the dimension of decision making that we are talking about. Uh, they always beg for a small tailoring and 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 a, an adjustment to to the message, but it's crucial to have those messages of endorsement, support, and leadership to bring us to the next level. Well, thank you. I'm glad we went two or three minutes over because I think that was a really great question and it was really interesting responses. So thank you all. Thank you, Anna, for leading us through a wonderful Q&A with our panelists today. Um, thanks to Gonzalo for helping us kick off an excellent briefing. It was uh, really great to hear his opening remarks. And to three just tremendous panelists, Ben, Tamara, and Carlos, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your presentations with us. Um, if anyone would like to go back, just as a final reminder, everything is available online at www.esi.org, including an archived webcast. So if you'd like to watch 
uh, the briefing again, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, the briefing series, like I mentioned before, would not be possible uh, without our honorary co-sponsor, the British Embassy Washington, or our partner, Henry M. Jackson Foundation. So thanks to those organizations for their generous support. Um, our um, What Congress needs to know in the lead up to the COP26 briefing series will resume on Wednesday with the role of international climate finance on October 20th and the negotiations what's on the table on October 22nd. I hope you'll join us for those as well as the one on November 18th, where we'll look back at COP26 and recap key outcomes and look ahead to what comes next. Um, if you would like to RSVP, if you haven't yet, or if you would like to download any of the resources, uh, the best place to do that is by visiting us online at www.esi.org. And when you visit us online, it would be a real shame if you did that and didn't sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, or our special COP26 daily newsletter, Glasgow Dispatch. So please do that when you have a moment. I think you'll find um, that they're really excellent resources and a great way to keep up with everything we're doing here at ESI. Um, I'd like to also thank my colleagues, Dan O'Brien, Omri Laporte, Emma Johnson, Anna, of course, Amber Todoroff and Savannah Bertrand for everything they did uh, in the lead up to today um, and overall for the briefing series to make it all possible. Thanks also to our interns, Isabella, Valerie, and Roshni for everything they're doing behind the scenes um, to make everything run so smoothly. Um, and I will leave us here. Um, this is a link to a survey. We collect survey responses after every briefing. We really value everyone's input. We read every response. If there's anything you'd like to share with us today about the topic, about the audio quality, vis uh, video quality, um, topics you'd like to see addressed, uh, anything like that, please take a moment and fill out our survey. We really, really value it. Um, we will end there. Sorry for going a couple minutes over, but thanks to everyone for joining us in our conversation today. And I wish everyone a very happy weekend.